Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. So uh, I am Barak Shishman, as Paula mentioned. I'm an assistant yeah. professor at UT Dallas. I actually recently moved to US around two and a half months ago. I spent seven years in Singapore prior to coming to US. So here is the content of today's talk. We will briefly talk about me and my research group, and then we will, um, I'm not sure if there is a problem on Zoom, but uh, we will talk about introduction of speech synthesis and voice conversion. Then we will be giving the history very briefly, and then I will show you some voice conversion applications. And then we will be discussing very briefly expressive uh, VC, emotional VC, and future directions. So I want to highlight that this talk will not be very technical because I know that many of us are from different backgrounds, but I will be trying to show you some models that we are using and what we are trying to achieve. So this is me. Uh, I have done my PhD at the National University of Singapore, and um, I spent some time in Singapore and in Japan, UK, and Turkey before coming to here. And I'm currently an assistant prophet at UTD at the electrical and computer engineering department. And my research mostly on speech, speech synthesis, machine learning, and I also do some research on emotion. So yeah, that's about me. So when we look at the, my research, uh, I would like to start uh, sharing that we humans express meanings and feelings through speech and machines are still unable to do the same in a human-like manner. So this motivates us to study the theory and practice of expressive speech synthesis. Uh, so as many of us believe that speech and language will soon become an integral part of any human machine interface that we have. So today I would like to firstly start with speech synthesis in general, and I will have a short transition to voice conversion. So when we say speech synthesis, uh, to some of you who are not in the field, you can think of this as a computer generated simulation of human speech. And when we look at the state-of-the-art speech synthesis frameworks, they are optimized to generate the natural speech, and which is not ready for real-time human-machine dialogue. So this is uh, mostly because um, today's speech synthesis frameworks do not attempt to understand and, understand and express empathy. And we believe that machines' ability to speak like a human in a live conversation will mark an important step. So if you think about it, an effective, engaging, and cooperative communication between two humans include kindness, expressing empathy, agreeing or disagreeing, and to seeking common ground, understanding feelings more than just being right or wrong, right? And we expect machines to do the same, but they are currently, the technology that we have in speech synthesis is not ready for this. So this motivates us to study uh, the theory and practice that enables such speech synthesis. So can you hear my voice, by the way? Because I am a little bit far to the microphone. So, okay. So, great. So uh, I would like to show, uh, play some speech samples from the history of speech synthesis so that you can uh, imagine the progress that we, had we achieved over the last uh, many decades. So I would like to first play uh, the speech sample from 1939, this one, from World Fair in New York City. So here you will see a conversation between a person and a machine. And this is one of the first speech, um, this is one of the first um, conversations that we have with speech synthesis model. Will you please make the voters say for our Eastern listeners, good evening, radio audience. Good evening, radio audience. And now for our Western listeners, say, good afternoon, radio audience. So this was the voice uh, synthesis, speech synthesis quality that it could, we could have many decades ago. And more recently, but again in the history, we have a synthesized speech, for example, from Haskins in 1959. I printed it where we without looking at a spectrogram. Can you understand it? Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask you the Homer Dudley experiment. Mm -hmm. Do you know what kind of synthesis it is? So, not in my mind right now. I have the information about it actually from for all these frameworks that are listed here, but not specifically the model. But definitely, it is not a deep learning method. These so are like what I'm yeah. Inek uh, once was telling me about he was telling me about how they used to have spectrogram like things on these back drums. Yes. And the drum would rotate and it would be like an old phonograph. Yes. Thing. So it's like that. I'm wondering how it's that. 
I think this is not that, no. but yeah, after I, I have the information about all these, maybe after the meeting, yeah. I can just quickly check and let you know. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So like in the more recent years, uh, again, but in the past around 1970s, we have frameworks from MIT, Bell Labs, from Europe, from KTH. For example, this one is from MIT in 1976. But the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. So in the more recent years, like in 2018, we have Tocatron too, that I think many of you heard about it. In planning its data processing techniques. So this is the performance that we could achieve with the uh, state of the art Tocatron in 2018. And uh, more recently, we have studied ways to uh, perform expressive TTS. Uh, for example, this is an example of a paper that we published in 2021 in IEEE ACM TASLP. So let me just play this sound. Planning its data processing techniques. So I will show some uh, technical perspective behind these frameworks in the next pages. But here, I just wanna show the progress that the speech synthesis field in general achieved over the last many decades. And as you can see, it has been a popular area for many years. So I highlighted that speech synthesis is the computer generated simulation of human speech. And voice conversion is a field under speech synthesis, which converts or changes the properties of speech. And these properties can be voice identity, it can be emotion, it can be accent. And these can be in one language like English, or it can be cross-lingual as well, for example, from French to English or from Mandarin to English. So in this seminar, we will discuss the theory and practice, the theory and applications of voice conversion together. I will be also sharing some of the recent papers that we published that uh, have codes publicly available as well. I will also share such uh, data sets and the codes that we release on GitHub. So uh, let's start with voice conversion. So explanation of voice conversion is actually very simple. We are trying to change the identity of a given speaker. So it is the study of how to convert one speaker's voice to sound like another speaker. So there are many ways to do this. And I will be showing you some techniques, some different techniques from statistical modeling to the deep learning. So, but here you can see the very typical voice conversion pipeline that includes speech analysis, mapping and reconstruction. So for all these steps, we may require to have different models or uh, we may combine some of these steps to build the voice conversion framework. I will be looking at the technical things a little bit more in the next pages. But I want, what I wanna highlight here is that during training, we have source and target speech, as you can see here. And these source and target speech can be in one language or they can be in different languages. These um, data set can be parallel, which means that source and target are speaking, are saying the same thing, or they can be non-parallel as well. Or even we have cases where we only have like one sentence from the target speaker. Uh, which we do one shot learning. So there could be lots of different possibilities for the training that as you can imagine. And once we do the training, uh, we have the source speech and we do analysis and uh, feature extraction, and then we do mapping and then we do reconstruction. So with reconstruction, it can be a, a signal processing method and it can, <laughs> no, it's okay. I am, I am used to talk, so <laughs> it can be a signal processing method and it can be a deep learning method as well. So I will go through these steps together, but basically this is the overall voice conversion pipeline that many uh, papers are building on. So uh, when we look at the voice conversion applications, this, te <laughs> this technology, if <laughs> this technology, if it works properly, it will allow tremendous opportunities for novel and innovative products. So these are some of them, like medical applications. We can improve the perceptual quality of speech. Like for example, we can convert from whisper speech to clear voice, or personalized conversational assistance, conversational AI, or there are things like talking heads, social robots, or cross-lingual applications that could be very useful. For example, I cannot speak French, but with voice conversion technology, we can actually target to generate my voice in French. So generating voices of particular people that they have, I mean, in some languages that they have never spoken before. So these are some of the applications that I find uh, interesting, but there are definitely more applications to that. 
So when we look at the history of voice conversion, uh, the very first paper was on vector quantization in 1988. And in, I am sure some of you know what vector quantization is. So uh, it is a basic, it was a basic technique, uh, just a second. Uh, it was a basic technique. Okay. It was a very basic technique where we do not require large amounts of data. So what I mean, uh, we don't require large amounts of data is just imagine that you have 30 utterances. Each of them are just three seconds, like 90 seconds of data from source and 90 seconds of data from target. That would be enough to train this. Like one, two minutes of data would be enough to train this model. So if you think about it, it is really you know, feasible to train such a model without even having a GPU. And this is the voice quality that we have with, with vector quantization. The groundhog clearly saw his shadow, but stayed out only a moment. So like this was, I believe the very first vo uh, voice conversion framework that was published. And on top of this, we had like fuzzy vector quantization methods. The groundhog clearly saw his shadow, but stayed out only a moment. I do believe uh, you may be familiar to Gaussian mixture models, GMMs. So for example, this voice is generated from a Gaussian mixture model framework. The groundhog clearly saw his shadow, but stayed out only a moment. And another framework that was generated, another voice that was generated from a non-negative matrix factorization, so also known as NMF. One odd detail. All these books were shelved indiscriminately without regard to the language in which they were written. So these frameworks were good because as I highlighted, you can train them with like two minutes of data from source and target speakers. So these are really very easy to build. But then in the more recent years, we have deep learning based approaches, like for example, LSTM. So this was the very first LSTM framework where you need to have parallel training data from source and target speakers, and you need hundreds of utterances. So compared to vector quantization, GMM, NMF, LSTM required large amount of training data. Uh, let me just play this. There is more behind this than a mere university ideal. And of course, with deep learning era, we have other frameworks like uh, deep neural networks. Anything unusual or abnormal was sufficient to send the fellow to Malachi. So, for example, uh, we started to build models that are based on PPG. So, uh, using a phonetic posteriograms in voice conversion became very popular. In one of the conferences, uh, a paper with PPGs and voice conversion got the best paper award. So, with that, um, it kind of it made the use of PPG in voice conversion popular. People even started to use PPG, a bilingual PPGs to uh, to perform cross-lingual voice conversion applications. So there was an era where many people are building average model, average voices with lots of speakers data and PPGs, then do adaptation with very limited amount of data, like just 20 utterance, just one minute of target data to generate target voice. And this is what we get with PPGs. There is more behind this than a mere university ideal. And more recently, we have like GANs and neural vocoders. Philip stood undecided, his ears strained to catch the slightest sound. So I want to highlight that we cannot directly compare these frameworks because as you can see with the development of statistical models and deep learning, we have very different types of networks and very different types of model. And all of them require different types of conditions. Like for example, for PPGs, we need to have the ASR model and we require lots of training data from other speakers. Like we leverage the public available data. Whereas for WaveNet, it is again similar. We train it with speaker. I mean, it, if we train a speaker independent WaveNet vocoder, we require lots of speakers data to train it. Then we do some adaptations to make it better for target speaker. So these are just some of them that I would like to, you know, I wanted to highlight today to just show you the big picture. I'm sure you know some of the terms that I am talking here today. So I would like to in particular focus on one of them. I do believe it is like this paper in particular is very simple and straightforward for those who are not working in voice conversion. This paper uh, was published in SLT a couple of years ago. So you can also access the paper from the QR code that you see here. So this is adaptive wavenet uh, vocoder for GAN based voice conversion. So this paper just, I mean, I picked this paper because I just want to go through the training uh, part of voice conversion. So we have, as you can see, three phases here. Uh, let me use the pen. Okay, so training phase one is generating 
is learning, uh, sorry, uh, finding a mapping between source and target speakers. And uh, to do that, we uh, because this is parallel they, and this is parallel data training. We have source speech and we have target speech. We first align them frame by frame, make sure that they are aligned with dynamic time warping. Then we train the generative adversarial network to learn the mapping between these two speakers. And in training phase two, we train a um, valid vocoder. So you can do this in many different ways, but here the trick is you cannot use lots of target data because then it will be cheating. So in this training phase two, we don't see the source or target speakers, but we just leverage publicly available data and train the wave network order. So uh, hypothetically, it should work for everyone. But in real case, it really doesn't work for everyone. So you generally need some sort of fine tuning, some adaptation to make it work for a particular target speaker. And in training phase two, what we did is that we obtained the converted features with the trained GAN. Blue means already trained network, while pink means training here. Then we do some sort of adaptation to the wave network order. Actually, this was kind of popular a couple of years ago to fine tune these wave network orders uh, so that they work better for particular target speakers. And you can do that with limit, very limited amount of training data, which is the trick for voice conversion. Because if you have lots of data, then you would train a TTS. But in real life, we generally don't have lots of data from everyone. So that's why we are mostly focusing on voice conversion, which is more practical in real life. But of course, TTS also has its advantages. If you have large amount of data from a particular speaker, we can build emotional expressive TTS models as well with that. So once we built this um, GAN-based voice conversion framework, what you do is that you have the source speech, you obtain some features. This can be with world, with straight, or with any other vocoder. So with this vocoder, we have this MALCAP0 features, F0, and a periodic team. So in this particular paper, we only do conversion on this uh, spectral features. This was this was a choice. So you can also try to convert the procedure. You can try to um, modify the duration, which is also practical, you know, because everyone speaks in different speaking rates. So, and um, when we build a voice conversion today, early in the meetings, I also received this question many times, like when you build voice conversion frameworks, how do you evaluate them or same for speech synthesis? So one thing that we do, I will also later show in one of the papers today, uh, we look at Malkevstrel distortion, some sort of distance metrics between spectrograms. And we also conduct listening experiments, which requires more time and more effort, but this is a must in our field. And what we do is that we uh, generate a bunch of speech samples and we ask listeners to listen them and judge. We have some particular uh, metrics like mean opinion score, MOS, or XAB preference test. And listeners are judging in terms of voice quality, speaker similarity, it can be emotion similarity, accent similarity. It can be literally anything that you want to compare. And to make sure the results are reliable, we tend to put some for example, we tend to put some original voices that should sound almost perfect to the listening experiments. And if the listeners grade low to those, or if listeners are not picked them as the best candidate, then we eliminate those listeners just to make sure that the tests are reliable because we need like 30, 40 people to, the, to do these experiments. And some of them are just randomly picking and it is anonymous, <laughs> and it is anonymous so we cannot tell which listener is that person, so it is just a way to get more correct results. I wanna just play some speech samples from the GAN framework. For example, this was GAN with a world vocoder. World vocoder doesn't have any deep learning in it. You can just see it like a signal processing toolkit. So this is the quality that we could have with a GAN together with a world vocoder. Philip stood undecided, his ears strained to catch the slightest sound. And when we use, for example, wave network order with some fine tuning and adaptation methods, this is what we get. Philip stood undecided, his ears strained to catch the slightest sound. So in listening experiments, we always observe that when we use neural vocoders, regardless of the type, like it can be wave RNN, wave globe, wave net. These have different types of training process. For example, training wave net takes much longer time than training wave RNN. So it is really up to choice. But we, what we observe is that when we use uh, neural vocoders, we achieve better performance in terms of voice quality in particular. So uh, we, we have gone through like 
some of the uh, historical aspect of voice conversion, some of the methods that are popular. And I want to look at the current challenges and some future directions and what we are doing with my students. So uh, one of the current challenges, many of the voice conversion frameworks that you see in InterSpeech, ICAS, TASLP, or in any other you know, speech-related journals is that they mostly work on monolingual cases, like both speakers are generally speaking the same language. It can be English, it can be Mandarin. So uh, building models that can work for cross-lingual application is definitely important because in the world, there are so many languages and we cannot obtain bilingual data. Like I don't speak French, you can never find my voice in French. So uh, we are trying to build such models that can handle cross-lingual applications. That is a current challenge that voice conversion has. And in addition to that, there, are, there is not much focus on expressiveness, speaking style, emotion, accent. Imagine that you have source and target speakers, but their speaking style is very different. If you just map the spectral features, you cannot directly map the speaking style. So, for example, you need to oftentimes modify the duration. So those things are all the current challenges of voice conversion. And definitely accent as well, because... Um, when I was in Singapore, we were building uh, speech synthesis models for public use, like for MRTs, for metro subways, for buses, because there is the conversational AI. I mean, machines talk over there. So, um, and you cannot generate British English because then people wouldn't understand. They have a particular accent that you need to understand. And I think same for ASR. I wasn't focusing on the ASR part, but you need to uh, get models that can actually understand Singaporean accented voices in English. It is English, but it has a very specific mm -hmm. accent. So with that motivation in mind, I would like to look at the expressiveness and I would like to share one of the paper that we recently have at ASRU. And then I will look at emotional voice conversion. I will show you some, I will share some of the codes that we released in the last one, two years and a database. <laughs> so, um, so then uh, when we look at the traditional voice conversion, um, it is really fine for me, by the way. It is really fine for me. I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> I like him. <laughs> so the traditional voice conversion focuses on speaker ID, as I highlighted. But all the data sets that we have, they, they have natural expression. So they are not expressive. We don't see emotion in it, which is not really realistic. Because when we talk, uh, we talk with emotions. You know, like when we are happy, we express it with our happy voices. But when we look at the voice conversion and speech synthesis data sets, it is not there yet. So human speech is expressive and we express different emotional states in our own styles. So the way I represent happiness is different than the way Paul expresses happiness as well. So, you know, these are all the things that voice conversion uh, field is currently lacking. So very basically speaking, what expressive voice conversion does is to convert emo emotional utterances. So to map the emotional style of speakers together with the speaker identity so that the generated voice is expressive. It contains the emotion and expressiveness of the target speaker, because this is what we are trying to achieve. At the end, we want to generate target speaker's voice. So to do that, this was a paper that we published in ASRU. We also have some papers pub submitted to ICAST this year on this particular topic. So this was a Stargan-based approach. To start with, Stargan is good in voice conversion because you can actually learn many to many voice mapping with Stargan. In computer vision, it is also possible. So this, the idea was uh, from computer vision field, which was adapted to speech synthesis and voice conversion as well. So what we do here is that we build emotion recognizers, em uh, speaker independent speech emotion recognizers to obtain some deep emotional features that will be um, inputted as additional, you know, deep features to generators uh, for both source speaker and the target speaker so that we can learn the emotional um, style of the particular people. So I'm just giving you, you know, uh, the big picture of the idea. The QR code is also here, but if you're interested to learn more, you can definitely ask me. Uh, we can share the codes with you and, you know, I, I mean, I'm happy to answer the questions. So here in this proposed framework, uh, we optimize the distribution of the generated features uh, to match the target from emotional data. And with this uh, additional emotional style that you see with SER that is given with orange color, the proposed framework learns to project emotional style together with speaker ID. 
And to that question that was asked to me many times, we first do male capsular distortion or some sort of, you know, distance metrics on spectrograms, just to make sure that we can achieve spectrograms that are closer to the target one. So for example, here, Stargan VC is the baseline and we have the proposed method. And what we do is that we look at the distance uh, of the Stargan samples to the original target, and we look at the distance of our converted to the original target. Then uh, what we see is that lower is better because this is the distance. We observe better results, both for intergender and intragender experiments. And once we have this in our minds, now we move on to listening experiments. So in listening experiments, because this is expressive voice conversion, we cannot just look at quality. We need to look at speaker similarity. We need to look at emotional style similarity. So to do those, we have MOS results. So together with XAB for speaker similarity. In XAB, what we do is that we give the original voice and then we give the baselines to the listeners as well. And we don't tell the listener which is which. So they don't know if it is a baseline or if it is not baseline. These are randomly assigned like A and B speech samples. And in every test, A and B can refer to something else. Sometimes A is baseline, sometimes A is the um, converted speech. So they need to pick. Uh, the one that sounds uh, closer, similar to the target in terms of speaker ID, in terms of emotional style and so on. So there are like other types of experiments as well, like best worst scaling and so on. But these were the three experiments that we wanted to you know, show in our paper. And we observed that the idea achieves better results in terms of speaker similarity, but as well as uh, emotional style, which we are trying to look at here as well. So um, another direction that we work on is emotional voice conversion. That is to basically convert uh, the speaker's emotional state. You can see this as the manipulation of emotion um, for this. I mean, yeah, it can be your happy voice and we are trying to generate your, for example, angry voice. We also try recently, more recently, we also try to look at problems like sometimes in a sentence you can have mixed emotions, like sometimes you can be happy and surprised, or sometimes you can be frustrated and sad. So we are also looking at those aspects in our recent submissions. So, so here I would like to very briefly go through emotional voice conversion with you. So the current challenges is that we have limited data. Um, when we look at the speech synthesis TTS data sets, you will see that emotion, emotional, clean, emotional, high quality data is missing. In the next page, I will also show some of the available ones and why we cannot actually apply them in our in this particular research field. And definitely, again, data like non-parallel training, because we cannot easily have parallel data from speakers. And emotional prosody modeling is difficult because emotional prosody is basically complex with multiple signal attributes. And uh, it is also difficult to control the output of emotional strength, which is something that we are focusing in our uh, recent uh, works. And we hope to build like models that can work for anyone. So we don't wanna build models for particular speakers because it is not uh, flexible. Like we wanna have models that can handle unseen emotions. Just imagine that you train the model with happy, angry, voices of people and we want to make sure that the model can generate if you train it with happy angry we want to make sure the model can generate sad as well you know like uh, we are trying to make sure that we can uh, build more general models that can handle unseen emotions unseen speakers these are you know all the real life problems so today in the last part of my talk i would like to go through an emotion speech data set we released, which is publicly available, and two emotion voice conversion frameworks, which are, again, the codes are publicly available. And I will share the QR codes and the GitHub pages here as well, for those who are, you know, just interested to go through them. So as I highlighted, emotional uh, speech synthesis and voice conversion data set is something that is missing in the field. Most of the voice conversion frameworks have lots of clean data, but they do not have emotion. Uh, in it that much. So these are some of the data sets that we listed. I'm sure there are more data sets available, but like these are the very common ones that the society are using. If you look at the first four data sets that I highlighted with this yellow color box, these data sets have very limited diverse of sentences. Like the very first data set that you will see here, uh, just a second, it only has two different English sentences. So definitely this is not enough for us to build 
a voice conversion or a TTS framework. Or for example, this Berlin emotional speech data that only has 10 different German sentences, which is again, I mean, 10 or 15, these are not good enough for us to build models. And there are some other types of data sets like EMOCAP or IMPROV databases, but uh, these contain overlapping speech, external noise. And if you look at the TTS voice conversion field, you will see that uh, we don't use noisy data sets. The, net, the frameworks that we have right now, they cannot handle noise that well. So that is a future direction that I will highlight in my next slides as well, because we always use clean data to train all the frameworks like Takata and everything that you see, they are trained with mostly clean data. And, you know, other data sets like CMU Arctic, which is like very famous, only contains one single emotion, like or MUSE database only MUSE utterances. So all the databases, they are really great so for some particular applications, perhaps, but when we want to build expressive TTS or expressive voice conversion frameworks, these are not enough for us. So what we did is that with one of our PhD student, Jokun, so he wanted to do this research a lot, but we discovered that we don't actually have the data sets to do this research, to build expressive voice conversion or emotional voice conversion frameworks. So we spent around one year to build a data set that can be used for monolingual, cross-lingual applications, as well as emotional voice conversion. So we picked Mandarin and English because uh, he can speak Mandarin and we can speak English. So, and those are the two languages in our field that are more common to build networks. Uh, so in our data set, we use five emotions, natural, happy, sad, angry, and surprise. And we collected 10 native English and 10 native Mandarin speakers. And we have five male, five female speakers from uh, each language. So which uh, allows us to actually train voice conversion framework for, mo for monolingual cases, for cross-lingual cases, from English to Mandarin or Mandarin to English, for five different um, emotions. So this is the uh, data set. You can just download this. I did this work when I was in Singapore. As I highlighted, I just recently moved to UT Dallas. So this is publicly available for everyone. And we also publish a paper after that on this data set. Uh, we did some experiment on this. So you can also see the QR code for this paper. Again, this is also publicly available. So you can just, I mean, if you're interested to use the database, you can also go through this paper to understand. Uh, we provide the statistics of the database here as well. So with this database, now we would be, I mean, we were able to train networks, emotional, expressive voice conversion, and, um, emotional and expressive voice conversion frameworks. So one of the first things that we did was trying to achieve a network that can convert anyone's emotion. Because when we look at the frameworks, they would be working for one person only, like they train the network for one or two people, and they are doing experiments on those particular mm -hmm. people. What we wanted to do is to achieve a network that can convert anyone's emotion. So towards a speaker independent emotional voice conversion. So to achieve this, um, we built a VAW GAN based network for both spectral and prosody features. And we also condition F0 on our generator for spectral mapping, which we observe much better results as outcome. So for those who are interested to you know, build a baseline to see how emotional conversion can work, you can just use this QR code. Our codes are publicly available. If you go to this GitHub page, you will see that we have different types of implementation for emotional voice conversion as well, like sequence to sequence modeling stuff. But this is just one of them, you know, that, that allows you to uh, do emotional voice conversion at runtime for any speaker that you have, even though you haven't seen that speaker in your uh, training. So how we achieve is that we do this with a speaker independent way of training. We use many speakers' voices to learn the mapping uh, for different emotion pairs. And this was a paper that published at Interspeech. And more recently, we have also published a paper at ICAS. So in this paper, we wanted to see if we can actually uh, generate unseen emotions. So which is practical because not always we can have every type of emotion from one particular speaker, right? So we are trying to solve like more real life problems that we could actually face. So um, this is a paper that we published at ICAST last year. It is seen and unseen emotional style transfer. So in this one, we have this encoder decoder discriminator uh, network where uh, 
input is emotional speech and we obtain our features and we train the encoder decoder discriminator with these features. But in addition to that, we have these deep emotional features from a trained SER where we actually can uh, manipulate it at runtime. Once you train this network at runtime, just imagine that you have an angry utterance, you can just input the angry deep feature, the fe deep feature of angry utterance. And you can make the network generate angry voices. So this was a good step towards generating unseen emotional style uh, of a particular speaker. So if you're interested, the codes and speech samples again is available here on this link, or you can just scan this QR code as well. So, uh, so, so, yeah, in these papers, um, we have the speech as an input, not the arousal. So we only focus on the speech itself. But in a more recent paper, what we try to do is we also look at the arousal and we try to modify. So we submitted that paper to this ICAST. <laughs> I yeah, he gives the answer as well. <laughs> So, yeah, so I mean, this is the QR if you want, if you're interested to, you know, train this network. So I would like to very briefly look at the future directions. As I highlighted, I mean, we can build uh, voice conversion based frameworks uh, for people whose native language is low resource, like we can generate low resource languages, because in, if you want to build TTS, you need T, which is text. So, but with voice conversion, we don't need the text. So this could be a good way of building um, playing uh, voices of people from low resource languages. This could be very helpful for those uh, societies. And again, speaking in non-native language or, you know, accent as I highlighted with, you know, Singapore or Australia case. And this could be also helpful for uh, people with speaking disability, like uh, voice conversion technologies are recently started to use for dissertic speech to clear voice or whisper speech to clear voice. This is definitely something very useful. And um, another thing is background noise. As I highlighted, we, I mean, the society always use clean data sets. And that is one of the problem. All the famous TTS frameworks, they mostly use clean data and they work pretty well, but in the presence of background or real data, they suffer. And again, emotional speakers, expressiveness, these are all the future directions to those who are you know, interested to start this research. And if you're interested to learn more about voice conversion and applications, we have an overview paper that we published a couple of years ago. This was like a collaboration. I started writing this when I was at the University of Edinburgh working with Simon King. So we were discussing with him these ideas. And at the end, we decided that, you know, we should write this paper. So with Junichi Yamagishi Haizo, Simon and I, we spent almost a year on this paper. We write this very slowly. So it focuses on... Um, from statistical modeling, deep learning era to deep learning era, evaluation metrics, data sets, available sources, and all, and challenges as well. So if you're interested, this is also a open access, publicly available for everyone. So yeah, just to sum up, I try to give the big picture of speech synthesis history, and I try to link it to a voice conversion. I didn't want to make a talk that is very technical because I thought that the background of people may not be voice conversion and speech synthesis. I do hope that you can now have a better understanding of these fields in general. And we have studied some applications. I tried to share some of the public available codes and data sets. Due to the interest of time, I couldn't put more, but if you can check those QRs or if you go to my website, you can see that we have more available. And lastly, we discussed some future directions. So that's all for my talk today. Thank you for listening. And I mean, feel free to email me if you have any questions as well. This is my email address. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, in general, what we first do is to look at uh, if you have the generated voice, uh, we do listening experiments. For example, a mean opinion score is one of them. We give many speech samples to listener and ask them to grade from one to five. Five means best, one means uh, first, and three means uh, in the middle. So in addition to that, we do preference tests, like we have a baseline and the proposed method, and we ask listeners to pick 
the better one in terms of quality, voice quality, speaker similarity, accent, emotion, it can be literally anything. And there are uh, more recently some neural network models like MOSNet, and there are some others that try to learn um, the way we do listening experiments. So, but uh, they are getting popular, but in the papers, we still see the original listening experiments basically, but it is still, def it is definitely a way to go in the society as well. Yeah. So when you said mean opinion score, right? Uh, I could listen to a speech sample and the question might be, does it sound natural? Or a completely different question might be, do you understand what's being said? Yes. And those are two different things, yes. right? Yes. And then it's the third thing might be, does it sound like it was spoken by a human? But different from that. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what to think of, but typically what is done in either synthesis first and then okay. they come in voice conversion. Because again, so when you say can you understand it we actually have also intelligibility okay. aspect so oftentimes we say can you also you know rate them in terms of intelligibility but we can also look at word error rates some tts papers also look at word error rates they also report that and we also for example in some of our papers we report speaker verification results for voice conversion just to make sure the speaker id is there. But as I highlight, as you highlight that for mean opinion score, it is generally naturalness and voice quality. Yeah. And you think people understand what voice quality means, for example? Because um, to me, that's something very technical. I don't know that yeah. I don't know automatically what voice quality means. Yeah, so uh, we explain them a little bit, but we also provide the original speech samples. Okay. So like there is a way of doing it that everyone in the field is doing, but I mean, I think you are definitely right because, because it is not good enough for the society. People in the recent years try to come up with, you know, some neural models that can replicate listening experiments. Like people are constantly, especially Japanese lab, labs like Junichi Yamagishi Tomakitoda, they are trying to come up with some neural ways of doing listening experiments, but, yeah, but listening experiments are still there. But in addition to them, we also look at uh, spectral distance metrics, like now capsule, but they are also not enough because sometimes MCD is very good, but it doesn't sound well. So that's why it is a combination of both, but there definitely should be a better way of evaluating, which I mean, some groups are working on it in the field. So that is something still needs to be focused on in the field. I had a couple of technical questions. So one of them was there is a slide where you had this, this three part training where one module was just to train the Bavnet, uh, or some decoder of some sort. Another one was just to learn the speaker mapping. Yes. Uh, if you go back to that for a second, my question was more about you said. Like for example, the second part, the one that you explained, the yeah, that one. So that phase two clearly requires a lot of data from many speakers. Yes. But none of them might be your source or target speakers. Yes. They are mm -hmm. just other speakers. But I don't know if that would be easy to get because after all, yes. Again, there is a lot of speech out there. Anymore. Now the first part, uh, source and target speech. Uh, I think you said that these are uh, parallel in the sense of people saying the same thing. Yes, in this paper, it was parallel, yes. So my question was, what is, so on the right side, how many hours is considered enough for phase two, how many speakers, just ballpark number. So if I had 10 hours from 10 speakers, is that enough for doing it a thousand hours from 10,000 speakers? And then for okay, phase two, what is considered enough? Okay, so in the training phase one, it is around 100 utterances from each speaker. Yes, like it is like 300, yes, exactly, like 300 seconds each, so it, should, it is like five to six minutes. So there's yeah, 100 utterances each of the speakers. Exactly, exactly, so it, this is training phase one. And training phase two, the more the merrier, because it is like the way network quarter, you train it with many speakers, but it is not thousand hours. Right. It is like tens of hours. Not thousand, yes. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. And not then, also to make it clear, neither your source nor your target speakers in phase one need be the, like in other words, phase three can have a completely different pair of speakers, correct? 
or does phase three have, no, have wrong. the same source? Of yes, time? yes. In training phase three, for example, here. So the idea here is to leverage publicly available data. Okay. So in training phase two, once we have the VNet vocoder, that uh, in theory should work for everyone. Uh, in training phase, we are using that to generate high quality voice. But when we just combine GAN and WaveNet, it doesn't work that well because there's a future mismatch there because the WaveNet has never seen the source okay. or target. And even though, I mean, the original paper says it should work, it really doesn't work that much. I mean, it works, but the quality is not that good. So to eliminate that, what we do is that in training phase three, we just use like 50 utterances of target. Like target. just 50, yeah, just 50 of target, like and very limited set. Fair, so, example, like so it is like, uh, so it is like in training phase three, imagine that you are doing voice conversion. Mm -hmm. So it is like you're, you have source, you do analysis, then you map it, then uh, you input it to your wave network so, coder. So phase three does require balance. Exactly, exactly, yes, but very limited. We even did this with like 20 utterances. Sure, no, we, no, arranged no. The, we arranged the limit, but 50 was good as far as I remember. Like when we used 50, we could actually, yeah, fine tune the vocoder. This was just like, the very first few ideas to, uh, so the yeah. Nonsense. I was trying to get the <laughs> that. So the idea is that in phase one, you'll have parallel speech. Yeah. And let's say the pairs of speakers you have the parallel speech for. In phase three, you still need parallel speech. So I'm going to repeat my question. But does that have to be a speaker pair that you've seen in phase Yes. Mm -hmm. Three okay. and one is same. So yes. it's not that, for example, like, you know, I can imagine I could get phase one speech because I could go look at all sorts of Shakespeare plays, which dozens of people have yes. written, like the same lines. And so I have parallel speech uh -huh. and things like that. So I would get parallel speech naturally. I don't have to connect it. Yes. Uh, but then in phase three, I do need to collect it from my target speaker and my. Okay, so yeah, so it's not like that. So if I want to synthesize Najib's voice, I would have to first capture him saying a bunch of things. Yes, and in I this would framework, say the same yes. Thing yes, exactly. Yes. In this framework, yes. Yeah. But so, for example, if we use cycle again rather than again, then we could do non-parallel as well here, because cycle again allows us to do non-parallel. Okay. So, but in this particular case, yes. So we would need your voice, Najib's voice. The same utterances. So hundreds of voice, hundreds of sentences for phase one, tens of hours for phase two, and something like fifty to one hundred sentences. And I guess the main goal of phase two is just to make the cabinet yeah. vocoder work with this weird capstone rather than the naturally occurring mm -hmm. because the GAN will produce something. Yes, different. exactly. That was the case actually because because the feature is converted and the VNet doesn't work that well. But that was the main problem. So when we use just world or straight, we still get better quality, even though we train WaveNet so much. Then we thought maybe we should do something there to see if WaveNet can handle. Yeah. Questions? I have a question. Yeah, sure. So is it possible to have as an output that changes over time? For example, if I'm like angry and then become uh, happy, is there like a... Uh... Actually, yeah, it, I, I do believe it is possible, but it is not something that has been done clearly yet. So actually we are... So we are trying, one of my students is trying to do that, like to understand the text, the emotion that is in the text and to generate the emotional sentence according to the text. So it is possible, yes, but I do not have papers published on that, but it is possible. So yeah, but it, yeah. Because the data is a problem there, if you think yeah. about it, yeah. the data is a problem. And is it possible to be angry with a British accent? Let's say. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is possible. Yes, that's possible. But uh, with, uh, another, like, accent, let's say. yes, but like for example, if you ask if there is like a state of the work doing that, there is none. Right. 
So theoretically, it is possible. You could have like multiple encoders and condition the encoders with accent and emotion, but there is no one like state of the art framework that can right now do that. There are like different types of papers out there popping up, but there is no like, because very recent research directions actually. Mostly so far, the companies on TTF, they tend to work on the clear data part, clean data aspect. And yeah, because of the data, but more recently, we see like noise robust voice conversion frameworks, accented and emotional voice conversion frameworks, like all in the last two or three years. Mm -hmm. yeah. It will be nice to have that Yeah, like, I think like it will happen. Uh, yeah. How, how can they generate like? Lexican accent going from Hungary to whatever. Yeah, yeah, you are right. Yeah. There are multiple papers that we work on and others also working on an accented voice generation, like making your voice sound Indian, Mexican, American, British. Okay. So there are there are works like that that we work on, but together with emotion, it brings more challenges. Like um, sometimes because when there are like multiple encoders, in one of our experiments, what happens is that when we try to change the accent, sometimes speaker ID also changes. Accidentally, in some of the experiments, we discovered that we try to change the accent only, but there are like multiple encoders and one of them is responsible for ID, one of them is accent. And sometimes the features overlap. And when we try to do the conversion, <laughs> We get Indian, but with a different voice ID. So there are those problems like implementation issues that generally we face when we have like multiple encoders, each of them handling a different type of feature. But it is a very interesting research direction that more and more people are working on right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? I think it could be done, but I need to look at the data. So I don't, so because I didn't use Voxelab much. So, okay. Hmm. But then we need to, we don't have the emotion labels, right? Yes. So I think that is the problem. Again. So you can link it with the emotion of the text, but, but it may not be the case. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is possible that it wouldn't be a very good data set, right? I guess what Daish is thinking is these are weak labels. So if you have mm -hmm. transcripts, yes. you could judge from the transcripts whether the yes. person is angry or not. And since the database is very, very large, yeah, you could probably find that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is possible. Just some processing is needed. Because it's there be so there's most of the conversation probably of different types of data that can be also. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One other question regarding evaluation, which has to do with uh, specifically with voice conversion rather than Does anyone use something like X vectors to decide if the synthesized voice sounds like the target speaker or not? Because I think one of the goals, if you wanted to convert your voice to sound like. I think Allah, yes, the answer is, is that, yes. Right? I think voice? yes. Mm -hmm. okay. We didn't, but I have seen a few papers. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Is it even close? I mean, can these things fool a speaker ID system? Are they so, yes. Mm -hmm. I have seen in voice conversion too. So, for example, in one of the VCC challenges, it was in 2018 or 2020, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly. So, for example, over there, um, they did, they generated the voices and then they used some speaker verification models uh, to assess. And then they also do the same experiments with human. And again, the male textural distortion. What they observe was the speech samples that we find, 
very unnatural. SPP verification systems couldn't tell that. And the ones that we feel they are really good, the speaker verification systems could fail saying that. So it wasn't correlated. They even published this. I think it was Speaker Odyssey 2018 in France. Like Tommy and uh, Junichi, they had like a panel to discuss that. I remember attending that panel. So yes, they are doing those things, but uh, there wasn't correlation back then. But maybe more recently there could be. The result you just said <laughs> makes sense to me because I would imagine that speaker verification systems they just pick up on the overall characteristics in the atlas, <clears throat> but they might fail to detect something which is obvious to human listener, but they might pick up something which is not obvious. To yes, to yes, it happened like that. I was a PhD student back then. <laughs> yeah. no, the reason I asked you whether it can pass muster is because. I'm sure you've heard about this. One of the longer term concerns about what conversion is people creating fake. Can one tell that this voice is actually a specific voice and not that? Yes. I think that was the motivation of that panel as well. But at the end, yeah, it didn't go very well. Yeah. So, one last question. How much, let's say, that we want to convert your voice to the voice? How much of your voice do we get? Okay, so if we if we have parallel data, it is less. If we have non-parallel data, it is more. But a few minutes would be okay. Yes. yes, but if you wanna have something really good, then it would be better to have more. But a few minutes of data, with like for example, with cycle GAN, it is possible if you have non-parallel data. So but of course when we increase the training, like voice quality may get better, speaking style may get better. So yeah, but a few minutes, there are papers that are doing in a few minutes. <laughs> but yeah, the more, the better. Yeah. yeah. A few minutes is less than two Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.